So thanks, uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. And uh, you know, sorry I couldn't go in person. And uh, the situation has improved now, so I could have, uh, I think, uh, but in hindsight. Um, so, uh, so anyway, let me let me start. Uh, so, so as many of you, I'm sure, know that the KPZ equation models uh, the growth of a generically growing random surface. And, uh, and this is the equation. So uh, informally, uh, if ftx is the height <clears throat> of a d-dimensional surface at uh, uh, time t and location x, the KPZ equation says that uh, the time derivative of f is some constant mu times the Laplacian, the spatial Laplacian of f plus lambda over two times the spatial gradient squared of f plus square root d times uh, white noise, space-time white noise. And the space-time white noise is, um, is a distribution valid centered Gaussian random field with this covariance structure, uh, the product of delta functions. So it's like having a, uh, you know, a Gaussian variable with mean zero and infinite variance at each point in space and time uh, with the correct infinity. Okay, and this can be rigorously defined. Uh, although the meaning of this equation, the KPZ equation itself um, is, uh, is hard to define. So now we know how to do it in one dimension, in higher dimensions, that's still a question. And uh, so very briefly, uh, the, this question was introduced by Cardinal Paris and Jan in 1986 as some kind of a universal model for random surface growth in the same way that uh, in probability, we understand Brownian motion as a universal model for many one dimensional processes. And uh, the study of the KPZ equation related topics is one of the most active areas in probability right now. And uh, the literature is huge. So today, you know, I have only half an hour, so I'll skip over the literature. So, you, you know, there are lots of resources in particular in, in my paper, the one I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, I have a brief survey of the literature. I'll talk about a few things from the literature, but um, generally. Uh, but let me only briefly mention that KPZ is now well understood in one dimension, but remains continues to remain mysterious in dimensions two and higher, although there are uh, quite a few results now. Uh, still, we have very little understanding of KPZ in dimensions two and higher. So a fundamental problem in constructing non-trivial solutions to KPZ in dimensions two and higher is that we do not know how, how to take scaling limits of approximate solutions to reach a non-trivial limit. And even in one dimension, there can be many different scaling limits, uh, but in many one-dimensional models, we know at least one way of taking a scaling limit so that it leads to a non-trivial solution. In higher dimensions, the question is much less uh, less tractable. And uh, what the physicists believe, for instance, in two-dimensional surface growth models, so you have a discrete random surface, it's growing, uh, and uh, there is a way to take a scaling limit, okay, which leads to a function valid rather than distribution valid solution. So, so these distribution valid solutions of KPZ in dimensions two and higher have been constructed in, uh, in recent years. Uh, although uh, these are what physicists would call trivial solutions in that, in the sense that they are basically Gaussian fields. Uh, and, um, but but what, what's more is that their distribution value, they're not, the scaling limits are not function valid and there is a belief as far as I've heard. So that in dimension, two, for a two dimensional growing surface, um, there is supposed to be a function valued solution. So there is a way of taking a scaling limit and the exponents, you know, how you scale space and time are supposed to be quite, complicated, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, some maybe, who knows, you know, irrational coefficients uh, or something. Uh, and so this has been verified again, this is, um, uh, so I don't know how depend dependable these numerical simulations are, but, uh, but remains out of the reach of rigorous mathematics. So, so there is a problem that we don't know. So usually when we're doing something like diffusion approximation, uh, we know what are the, uh, you know, how we, how we should scale space and time to get the limit. Okay. In, in many other things in probability, we know how to take how to scale space and time. Here, the question about how to take how to you know scale space and time as you as you're taking a limit that itself is uh, is not clear and it's not known in most cases. So so I'll today I'll present a small step towards uh, this this issue. You know my, you know my my goal was to try to understand this KPZ growth, uh, and this is based on some framework that was introduced recently, but. Uh, you know, the, the eventual goal is more ambitious, but for now, you know, uh, the, uh, let me present the thing that I have. So that since the correct way to scale is still mysterious, uh, we, we do the following, we propose the following that uh, consider a general class of growth models, which contains at least one model of interest. Uh, and, uh, and then show that irrespective of how we take a scale, scaling limit. So, you know, I struggle with that 
for for a while that uh, you know how even if you're talking about local KPZ behavior locally you know KPZ type growth uh, how would you um, uh, how would you deal with that un unless you know how to take a scaling limit? So then this is the idea that irrespective of how you take a scaling limit, no matter how you take a how you scale space and time, the growth is always locally, like the KPZ equation, breaking up as a sum of a Laplacian term, a gradient squared term, and a noise term, and a residual term that is negligible compared to the other three terms and their sum. So surprisingly, this turns out to be doable. And so I'll now tell you the details of this. Uh, so, so in, in a general class of models, you can show that uh, that no matter how you scale space and time, you always see KPZ behavior happening locally. Okay, and I'll give you an, an application of that also. So, so first the definition, and it's pretty general as you'll see. Uh, so, take any dimension d bigger than or equal to one. Okay, suppose you have a collection of random surfaces, random functions f epsilon, uh, where epsilon uh, is all positive epsilon, and so you can take epsilon to zero eventually. And these are functions defined on two coordinates. One is the space, the discrete, discretized space, which is z to the d. The other is time, which is discretized time, which is not negative integers, and these are real values. So, so f epsilon t x denotes the, height, denotes the height of the surface at time t and location x. A general rescaling of this f epsilon is defined as follows. So you want to go from a function on this discrete space into Euclidean space. So you take any alpha, beta, and gamma depending on epsilon, where this alpha and beta denote the scalings of, of space and time. And you define the rescaled version f super epsilon. And now the coordinates are positive reals cross uh, you know, real vectors, uh, defined as f epsilon t x as this multiplicative factor gamma times f sub epsilon, which is uh, your original function, add this rescaled time and space. So these are the integer parts above, uh, okay, the ceilings. Um, so this is uh, t over alpha and x over beta. So, uh, so any questions about this? So this is just a general, general scaling. As epsilon goes to zero, you have a sequence of models uh, and you want a scaling limit of that. So this means that we are rescaling space and time so that successive time points are separated by alpha and neighboring points in space are separated by beta. Okay, we are rescaling the lattice. And this factor gamma is just a multiplicative factor meant to ensure the limit uh, of f epsilon epsilon goes to zero or on some appropriate space is, is non-trivial. So it's just a factor you put in front. And um, that's why we need alpha and beta to go to zero because we want this, uh, the difference the, difference between neighboring points in space and time both to go to zero as you're taking the scaling limit. But there is no restriction on gamma. So this is a general model of, a, of a, you know, what you would call a scaling limit of a sequence of uh, surfaces that you have, or random surfaces. No, <clears throat> okay. So this is completely general. Now, uh, when do I say that this sequence uh, has local KPZ growth? Okay. So let A denote the set of, uh, set consisting of the origin and its nearest neighbors in z to the d. And then you define a local average of your function f super epsilon uh, in the rescale lattice as just the usual thing that you would imagine what is, uh, you know, you take a point and take the point at all its neighbors in that rescale lattice and you average over the value of the function on that. So that's, that's, the, that's the local average. Once you have that, okay, so then you define a few quantities. You define the approximate time derivative as exactly what you think it is. So you, look, you have the function on this rescale lattice. You look at uh, some Tx and you look at one step ahead in time. Uh, and then you define this uh, time, discrete time derivative. And then you find a discrete Laplacian, which is the local average, um, local spatial average minus the value at the point divided by a beta squared, okay, times some factor. And then you find the approximate gradient squared like this. Uh, you take the function at uh, t, uh, comma x and all its neighbors and subtract off this average value. So there is a reason why I'm subtracting off the average value instead of the value at the point, which is more natural, uh, divided by the beta, by beta squared. And, but, but in any case, um, suppose f was co converging to a smooth function as epsilon goes to zero, all of these would converge to the right thing. So, so the discrete 
The approximate time derivative would con converge to the time derivative. The approximate Laplacian would converge to the Laplacian, and the approximate gradient squared would converge to the gradient squared. Uh, now, in general, of course, we don't expect f epsilon to converge to a smooth limit, but this is the reason uh, this is what, how these are inspired these definitions so suppose we we have these definitions and here's the definition so uh, of local kpz growth so we will say that f, f super epsilon is local kpz behavior is epsilon goes to zero if for some strictly positive new lambda and d depending on epsilon and some random map uh, xi epsilon and r epsilon we have the following that the discrete time derivative of f super epsilon is new times uh, this, this approximate Laplacian plus lambda times the approximate gradient squared plus square root d times this function plus this residual term such that the following hold. The noise field converges in law to white noise as epsilon goes to zero in some appropriate sense. Okay, so there are several different senses in which you can, can converge and consider convergence of random distributions. So there is a particular sense that I write in the paper. It's uh, commonly used thing uh, that this uh, law of the white noise uh, so this 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 field psi epsilon converges to white noise as epsilon goes to zero and the remainder term is little o p of the first three terms on the right and there's some meaning that if you take this term and take the ratio of this residual term with this full thing new times the discrete laplace and that goes to zero in probability as epsilon goes to zero and similarly for the middle term and the third term. So this is really, you know, with high probability, this is negligible, this is negligible compared to the other three terms. So this is when I say, um, you know, roughly that this is a local KPZ behavior. That is, you have the sequence of functions, you have this rescaling uh, and uh, well, who knows if the function, these rescale functions are converging to some limit in, on some space of distribution. So I'm not worried about that right now. Uh, what I say is that these functions have this local KPZ behavior if you see this thing happening. That is, this discrete time derivative becomes um, some constant times the discrete Laplacian plus some other constant times the discrete gradient squared plus uh, some other constant times uh, thing that is converging to white noise plus a remainder term which is small compared to the other terms. It's just a definition. Uh, I have a question, no, sorry. Yes, yeah. I have a question. Could you also have a same with integral form? I mean, you integrate the time. I mean, do you try um, this? You can, uh, you can do that. Um, you, I don't, you don't say anything about initial value, by the way. Yeah, no, there, there's. I don't. I don't care about the initial value. So, so you can you can do the integral. Although, what can happen is that these are very rapidly fluctuating things. So, so when you do the integrals, some things may vanish. So, for example, these things may become much smaller than what they are typically when you integrate. And so this remainder term being negligible compared to the other things, you know, this whole question, the complications will come in in the correlations. So, so that, you know, then you'll have to say something about how things are correlated at distant places. So here I'm only saying that this noise field has some particular correlation structure that is it's becoming like white noise. Uh, I'm not saying anything about the correlation structure of the other terms. And uh, so that, you'll have to say things about that if you want a uh, more global uh, convergence, global mode of convergence. So, uh, okay, so that's, that's a good question. Um, so, so here are some remarks. Um, so it may seem as if new lambda and D should not be allowed to vary with epsilon since the coefficients of Laplacian gradient squared and white noise in the KPC equation are constants, but this is not true. In the KPC literature is understood that the coefficients can be allowed to vary when taking a scaling limit, even be allowed to tend to zero or infinity. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's okay, and we'll see that you somehow have to allow that um, in dimensions two and higher. So this is especially true in dimensions higher than one. In this family which check scaling that I mentioned uh, requires seems to require this. Okay, so what's the motivation for this kind of definition? The motivation for this local definition of KPZ growth, growth comes from this desire to create some kind of universal framework for scaling limits of discrete surface uh, growth are analogous to diffusion approximations of Markov chains. So recall that a diffusion process adapted to a filtration is characterized by this local growth conditions that the expected value of xt plus h minus xt given ft is some axt times h plus little o of h and the expected gradient squared uh, is bxt h plus little o of h and the expected gradient cubed is little o of h as h goes to zero for any fixed t. And this gives an informal representation 
Once you put down these conditions, this gives an informal representation of the stochastic differential equations, dxt is axt dt plus root bxt dbt without actually defining the equation. So, so these conditions are basically saying that this process is following this, um, uh, this path, but you, you are not defining uh, it or uh, integrals. So the purpose of the local KPC growth is to do the same for surface growth, give this kind of a, of a representation, uh, local representation, uh, since we yet do not know how to define um, this, um, um, uh, these uh, proper you know, integrals. Okay, so let me uh, give you the main theorem now. Uh, I need a little bit of preparation for the main theorem. Uh, so, so recall that uh, A was the set of zero, uh, the origin and its nearest neighbors in Z to the D. Let phi be a function from on R to the A real valid function. So this is what this phi is doing, uh, it'll soon, uh, sorry, so it'll soon become clear. So let me, let me wait until then. Let Z be a collection of ID and variables at each point in discrete space and time. Okay, we'll refer to this as a noise field. And then you consider a growing surface defined as follows. Now here I have an initial condition. It starts from all zero on discrete space and time. And, uh, and then at each location in space and time, you define the height at time T plus one as this function applied to the heights at time t at locations which are neighbors of x, okay, and at x itself, okay, uh, plus uh, epsilon times um, uh, this uh, noise field, okay. So you have this. Th here is the only place where where epsilon comes in, okay. Uh, so so this phi doesn't has no dependence on epsilon. So what what I'm doing here is that I'm considering a generic growing surface defined as follows, uh, you have the heights at time t and x, okay, uh, all, all locations, and then the height at time t plus one is this function, this given function applied to the heights at that location and its neighboring location at time t. So you apply that function, plus you add a random noise, and the random noise, uh, it can be small. So, so we'll lo we're looking at the small noise limit as epsilon goes to zero, you know, how and then we are look, presumably you're looking at some scaling of space and time so that you get some meaningful scaling limit, okay? So, so, so here's what I said, imagine F epsilon Tx to be the height of a D-dimensional surface at time T and location X. And this recursion says that the height at time T plus one is a function of the heights at X and its neighbors at time T plus an independent random fluctuation where the random fluctuation is epsilon times something. So this is what I have been thinking about for the last one year. Um, so this was introduced in a couple of papers and also a follow-up work uh, with, uh, with uh, Sukunidis. Uh, and, uh, and two of these papers deal with just completely de deterministic growth without the noise and, uh, and see what happens. So, so under fairly general conditions, uh, you know, I showed in one of these papers that if we don't have noise, then this converges to a deterministic KPZ equation. So, so I'll, I'll tell the conditions later on. And then uh, under more relaxed conditions, you in this paper, we showed that we, you get more general equations than KPZ. So we we'll later see that the model of, of directed polymers in random env environment, which is one of the, uh, you know, very prominent models in this literature, uh, can be put in this framework. So there's at least one model which can be put in this framework and there are some more, but I'll not talk about that. And so also some, some ongoing work. Okay, so any questions about this, uh, this model here? Okay. This is a fairly general model where uh, you have this idea that, uh, that the growth of the surface is affected not only by the growth at the, uh, the height at that point, but also its neighbors plus. Let me make some assumptions about this phi, this function phi that I'm applying. Uh, so uh, here notation, the one denotes the vector of all ones for u uh, in the space, u bar denotes the average of the coordinates of u and for u and v we will say that u bigger than f of u if, they, if u dominates v in each coordinate. So we make the following assumptions and these are, as I found out, these are fairly standard uh, in the PD literature about uh, other kinds of, uh, you know, uh, Hamilton Jacobi systems. Uh, so, so you have uh, equivariance under constant shifts, which is if you take a vector and you add a constant to all coordinates, the result is just the original result that you get plus that constant. So what this means is that if you take a surface and just shift it by a constant, you increase the height at all points by a constant, 
And then you look at the new surface that's generated after that, uh, the new surface is also shifted by the same constant, which is quite reasonable. Zero at the origin. So this is just a technical condition. You know, you can always fix this. Um, monotonicity, which means that if one surface completely dominates another at time t, and you apply the same noise, then at time t plus one also, the, this surface will dominate the other one. So this domination will continue. Symmetry, so this is, um, this is for a technical, again, simplicity. Uh, it, this can be dropped or relaxed. Uh, this phi remains unchanged under any permutation of the coordinates of u. And regularity phi is c2 in the neighborhood of the origin. And this is a strong restriction, but we'll consider this, that it's, it's smooth, uh, it's twice continuously differentiable. Non-degeneracy, uh, this is basically so that the gradient squared term in the KPZ equation can arise, that the Hessian of phi at the origin is non-zero. And so these are all, uh, you know, general regularity conditions on this uh, function, this driving function phi. And there is one more assumption, which is a crucial one, which is the following. So the Edwards-Wilkinson surface growth model fits into this framework with phi u equals u bar. So the Edwards-Wilkinson surface growth model is very simple. It's just saying that you have the heights at time t. The height at a, at a point at time t plus one is obtained by taking the average of all the heights at x and its neighbors, and then adding a random fluctuation. Okay, so it's just a very simple process. It's a linear growth. Uh, you can exactly write down uh, the height at time t and location x as a function of all the noise variables. And this fits into the framework with phi u equals u bar, which is the average. So we assume that our surface growth grows at least as fast as the Edwards-Wilkinson surface, meaning that phi u is bigger than or equal to u bar. So, so, the, so the expected height at time t plus one at location, given the history up to time t, is at least the average of the heights at, um, at time t uh, and at that, at that location. And uh, moreover, we assume that this domination is strict in the sense that if un is a sequence so that uh, phi un minus un bar goes to zero, then un must, uh, in each coordinate, un minus its average value must be good also going to be good. This is just a technical thing again. Uh, but the main thing is this, that, uh, uh, that it dominates Edwards Wilkinson growth. So, so I don't know why this is, uh, this is important, but it seems to be uh, what's holding the thing together. And, and uh, you know, um, if this doesn't hold, you may not see, uh, you know, KPZ or even the surface may become highly discontinuous if doesn't this doesn't hold. So one example is this recent work of Kanizar and Hirer uh, on this Brownian castle, where uh, the growth is uh, roughly speaking that uh, you have all the heights and then you choose. Uh, you know, one of the neighbors and uh, at random, and uh, you 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 do a sort of you know, infinite temperature ballistic deposition. Uh, so, so in any case, so, so this, um, so in that model, this condition is not satisfied. It's not uh, growing at least as fast as Edwards Wilkinson. And, and then you see uh, the scaling limit is highly discontinuous. So you have that, uh, uh, you know, the, the surface, in one, it's a one dimensional model and you, the surface that you get, get, get is not even a continuous uh, curve. So, um, so you can have all, the, all these anomalies. And for example, in last passage percolation, so I haven't mentioned that, but for those of you who are familiar, uh, you have this because in last passage percolation, the growth is phi u is just the maximum of all the coordinates, neighboring coordinates. So this is the assumption of strict Edwards Wilkinson domination. So we later see that this model of directed polymers and random environment satisfies all of these assumptions. Uh, and we make the following assumptions about the noise field. Uh, we assume mean zero, we assume it's bounded, and we assume that its law is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure. So, uh, so, and then let's say we have a random surface with this driving function with this noise field. Let alpha, beta, and gamma be any positive real numbers so that alpha and beta tend to zero as epsilon goes to zero. And we define the rescale surface like this, scale time by alpha, scale space by beta. And then you have this multiplicative gamma in front. So here's the main theorem. So suppose that all these stated assumptions about phi and z are satisfied, let f super epsilon be the rescale surface uh, with any alpha, beta, and gamma with the sole condition being that alpha and beta goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. These are the scalings of space and time. 
then f epsilon is local kpz behavior and no matter how you scale space and time so you can be looking at arbitrarily uh, long distances in time and you know as epsilon goes to zero so times can you know uh, times can scale time can scale like e to the minus one over epsilon squared or something like that you know can be growing very very fast uh, but you still have uh, that you have local kpz behavior with these specific coefficients mu is like beta squared over alpha lambda is like beta squared over alpha gamma and d is like epsilon squared beta to the d gamma squared over alpha and these q and r and sigma are some things associated with the noise variables and the driving function okay and uh, this particular this q minus r is positive under the non-degeneracy condition so you have this local kpz behavior okay so i'll uh, not sorry, I'll not stop for questions. I'm running out of time almost. Uh, so, um, so, so suppose so. One interesting thing is suppose we want mu lambda and d to remain bounded above in the Lebesgue constants as epsilon goes to zero within these things. So, what do we get from these equations? So, so recall that up to constants, mu is beta squared over alpha, lambda is beta squared over alpha gamma, and d is epsilon squared beta to the d over gamma squared times gamma squared over alpha. So if you want the first thing to be one, to be order one, we need beta squared to be like alpha, which gives for, uh, lambda is like one over gamma. So if we also need lambda to be order one, we need gamma to be order one. And finally, if we want D to be order one and we have beta squared is like alpha and gamma is like one, to get epsilon squared beta to the D minus two is like one. So, but we also need that beta goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero because beta is a, is a uh, you know spatial scaling. Uh, so this is impossible. So since we have this condition, epsilon squared beta to the d minus two is of order one, we cannot have this unless the dimension is one. Okay, unless the dimension is one, we cannot fix that new lambda and d to be uh, to be bounded away from zero and infinity as epsilon goes to zero with this local KBZ behavior. When d is one, uh, let's see what what we get when d is one. This last equation tells you that beta should be epsilon squared. This equation will tell you that alpha should be like epsilon to the fourth. And this tells you gamma should be order one, okay? And we'll see that this is exactly this intermediate disorder regime. Uh, you know, I'll, maybe I'll just briefly talk about that, uh, you know, of Albert Scannon and Coastel from 2014 for directed polymers. Um, so this, this is the only way that you can have that the coefficients are of order one in dimension one and dimensions two and higher you cannot cannot have that you must send some uh, of the coefficients to zero or one zero or infinity so here's the example uh you just let phi to be log of e to the ua uh, uh, the average of these things and it's e easy to check that this is equivalent in a constant shape zero at the origin monotone symmetric c2 hsn is non-zero and this is also convex and then the following lemma shows that this is strictly dominating Edwards Wilkinson. So, so I have this lemma which say, shows that if phi satisfies all the other conditions and uh, its uh, Hessian is non zero and so on, and it's convex, then phi, phi satisfies a strict Edwards Wilkinson domination. So, whenever you have a convex driving function, you have the Edwards Wilkinson domination. And uh, the directed polymer model is just the, our model with, with this phi. Okay, so when you have this phi, uh, you can write down exactly, you can solve this recursion, write down exactly the height at time t and location x as a function of all the noise, and it comes out as a sum over, you know, log of a sum over e to the power of paths, okay? And, uh, you know, for, for certain technical simplicity, I'm taking lazy random walk paths instead of you know, usual random walk paths. Uh, and so thus we arrive at this result, which is, um, the random surface generated by D plus one dimensional directed polymer model at inverse temperature epsilon. So as epsilon goes to zero, uh, the inverse temperature going to zero, it behaves like locally like a KPZ growth, no matter how you scale space and time, okay? In the directed polymer surface growth, no matter how you scale space and time, you always see this local KPZ behavior coming up. And these coefficients nu lambda and d are given by uh, epsilon and our choice of space time scaling. So I gave you some explicit formulas for that. And, and the only way, so just to finish, and the only way to scale this space and time so that you get 
uh, this uh, these coefficients to be constants is uh, this uh, what is called this intermediate disorder regime uh, where um, where you take these alpha to be epsilon to the fourth and beta to be epsilon squared and gamma to be constant, which exactly translates to for polymers of length n, uh, the inverse temperature being taken to be n to the minus one fourth and looking at polymers in a special window of n to the half, okay? And moreover, there is no way to do this uh, to keep the coefficients constant in dimensions two and higher, but they can vary, okay? Okay, so let me stop here, thank you. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, are there questions? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of times the family VJAX scaling. Uh, th does it relate to VJAX model for collective dynamics? And if so, is there a, what is the relationship between that model and KPZ? Well, I'm not not familiar with that model. So, um, so you know, I, I try to look. It's um, it's not it's not com completely clear. You know what the predictions are. You know what what this says is that. Uh, in two dimensions, for instance, uh, so suppose you are taking this epsilon to zero, I mean, some kind of mollifier, you're trying to define the equation of the mollified white noise and you're taking epsilon to zero in the mollifier. And uh, you, you have these coefficients in front of the Laplacian radian squared and the white noise. And these coefficients have to be taken to zero in a certain way so that you get a limit. And a certain way means that there should be a relation between the exponents. So you, the new lambda and D should behave like epsilon to the alpha epsilon to the beta epsilon to the gamma, something like this. And there should be a relation between these exponents, which have to be always satisfied. And if the, the things are chosen correctly, then you get a function valued limit. You know, that's as much as I, as I understood, but uh, uh, you know, it's, not very, it's not very clear to me exactly. I mean, I, 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 you know, maybe some of you can help me, but uh, you know, I don't know a place where it's you know, exactly written down where the, what the predictions are. Um, but uh, yeah, so sorry, sorry about that. And and I'm not familiar familiar with the with the model that you mentioned. There is also a question in the chat from Andrik Weber, uh, who asked, "Could you say a word on the relationship of what you do and recent work by Caravenna, Sum, and Ziguras?" And then uh, there's also the archive of the paper. I don't know if you. Okay, so let me see the paper. Uh, ah, the critical 2D. Um, um, so, the, so this critical 2D, uh, 2D thing, um, so in two dimensions, there, there were several works in the last few years, and you know, I was involved uh, in one of them with Alex Dunlop. Uh, and in 2D, you can show that there is a way to scale space and time, um, and uh, so that these coefficients in, in front of the, um, okay, so in coefficient in front of the Laplacian and the noise term are remaining constant, but let's say the coefficient in front of the gradient squared term is going to zero like one over root log epsilon, something like this. Or you can pose it in a different way also with different kinds of scaling. Uh, and then as you do that, as you remove the modification, uh, you get a distribution valued limit. So you have, you have a random distribution, uh, you, get a, you get a scaling limit and you can say that's KPZ, uh, that's KPZ surface growth. Now, uh, so what we did, you know, with Alex Dunlop, uh, uh, what what we did, and then uh, there were subsequent work by uh, by these authors in Karavan Hassan and Zigurus, uh, that um, uh, you uh, you know these limits. So this this limit was always in some kind of subcritical regime. That is, beta, the let's say, you know, the the coefficient. So in the, in the framework that I'm mentioning, the coefficient in front of the gradient squared is lambda over root log epsilon. Lambda is small enough, something like that. If it's small enough, then you get um, uh, then you get uh, 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 you know a random distribution, and then that's equivalent to a Gaussian process. So that's like a solution of the stochastic heat equation with some other other coefficients. Okay, so you get a Gaussian process limit, which, as I said, the physicists would call uh, a trivial solution. Now, what they have done is that they have taken this lambda all the way all the way to a critical value where I think you still get a distribution valued limit. I may be wrong, but I think you still get a distribution valued limit, but it's non-Gaussian. So there is a non-Gaussian uh, behavior that you see at the critical value. Um, and so that wouldn't be a tri trivial object uh, in, the, in the physics sense, uh, because you, you do get a non-Gaussian uh, process, non-Gaussian distrib uh, random distribution uh, as a scaling limit, but, 
as far as I understand, again, I may be wrong, but uh, it's still not function valued. And there is a conjecture. That's what uh, I've heard, you know, actually Martin, Martin told me uh, that uh, there is a conjecture that there is a way to take a scaling limit uh, where you do get a function valued uh, limit in two dimensions. And so that is completely not, not clear to me you know, how, how to get that uh, or if that is at all possible. But yeah, so this is, uh, you know, yeah, this, this is this is uh, recent work uh, of Karabina San and Ziggurus where they, and they get a non-Gaussian non limit, but uh, extremely familiar with these papers. Uh, so I don't know all the details, but this is roughly what it seemed to me that they have been able to push the thing to, the, to this critical point where, where you get a... Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. We have uh, time for. There are two questions. Uh, first question. One is on the chat. Uh, is about the 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 Hessian of phi is uh, asking if it's is it positive definite? Uh, no, no. The Hessian of phi is uh, so. Uh, so I don't require phi to be convex. So if it is convex, then the Edwards Wilkinson condition is automatically satisfied. The domination condition, but it can be satisfied even if it's not convex. So, uh, so I don't need it to be to be positive. Definitely. Okay, and um, I, am, I was wondering, I was trying to picture, if you want, you mentioned this Brennan Castle by Ayrer Carizzaro. If you wanted to capture also this locally, what are the assumptions that uh, sh should be drawn? Uh, you should, should you change the noise or rather like the smoothness of phi? Or no, so, so what, what the model of cancer and higher, they're looking at, uh, you know, this, zero, uh, you know, uh, the infinite uh, temperature uh, ballistic deposition growth, uh, which does not satisfy this Edward Wilkinson domination. And that's the reason why what happens is that uh, it's it sort of the surface sort of looks like a, like a Cauchy process, you know, that is these huge discontinuities everywhere. Uh, you know, in the surface. The surface is not continuous, as far as I understand. The surface is not continuous. And you have these huge discontinuities. And that's the kind of thing you can expect to see whenever this Edward Wilkin Wilkinson domination is not satisfied, okay? So, uh, so somehow the neighbors have to tie with each other. So the main, you know, um, message of the theorem that I have is that if this condition is satisfied, then the neighbors are close to neighboring heights are close to each other, no matter how far you go in time. So suppose you start with some epsilon very small, then of course, at the first stage, the neighbors will be close to each other. At the second stage, the neighbors will be close to each other. But what I, what I am uh, saying that when I, when I say that it's irrespective of how you scale space and time, what I mean is that no matter how far you go in time, the neighbors are always sort of epsilon close to each other, remain epsilon close to each other, they're tied to each other. But if you have a model as of Kanzar and Harer, there is the neighbors do not remain tied to each other. Neighbors can have huge differences, huge gaps between them. And there is no way to fix that other than changing the model. You know, if you, even if you change this, you know, noise or something, it's not going to fix that. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot uh, again to the speaker. <laughs>